Right now, I'm happy to welcome Violent J and Shaggy Too Dope, Insane Clown Posse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here to Studio Q. Uh, first things first, welcome back to Canada. Thank you. Thanks, man. Um, I said in the intro, it's been 10 years, but it might have been longer. Is that Something right, Shaggy? Like that. Yeah, like 16 years, I think. Yeah. Why so long, Shaggy? Because uh, Canada didn't want me in Canada, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, more so me. Yeah. No, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so you know, it, I, it took yeah, a while to clear up the the record. Yeah, is that the, yeah, yeah? The, the clear up the record, get off probation, and whatnot. You know, mm -hmm. which is crazy because like we've been to like Europe and Australia and all that since, but just Canada, it's just that tough nut to crack. Well, we, with as far we, as the government, we grew up, we in. grew up with that here. Like you know, you buy a ticket for a show and you're not sure if the artist is going to make it across the border. Our yeah. borders are pretty notoriously tough. Uh, a lot of our crew didn't make it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> they you know, still didn't make it. We're on a skeleton crew right now because a lot of people got turned down at the border. Well, yeah. another thing I wanted to ask about if it made it is the American soda called Fago. Because I understand, you. well, you guys, obviously, your shows, you, split, you spray huge amounts That's right. uh, of Fago. And in Australia, in Europe, you've had some problems at the border. Yeah. Well, we couldn't bring, you know, we usually go through about... Uh, Maybe close to 352 liters of uh, Fago soda per show. That's just a, a general. 352 liter bottles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, but that guess, depends kinda. on the size right. of the stage and how often we reach for them and this and that. But going to another country, you can't bring all that Fago soda. That if they think you're going to sell it or whatever, you know. So we've had to use other stuff and, and put like a sticker on it that says Faco, you know <laughs> what I mean? And and it's just for the fun, yeah. you know, it's not the original juice, but it's cool. But here, they actually do sell Faco. Oh, okay. They sell it yeah, in Windsor. It's distributed over here, so yeah. we're able to get it, yeah. Okay. So we're able to purchase it here. And so we have the actual authentic Fago juice with us. We'll be here on the Canadian tour. That's right. All of it. Yes. The entire tour, we, we won't have to substitute what I call the precious liquid. <laughs> Part of me wishes, though, I could see those border conversations about the Fago. Have you ever been there, like in Australia, for that conversation with the border official, like wondering what is going on with this volume of... No, we, not. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have to deal with that, thank God. <laughs> uh, we got enough we got to deal with with customs. Exactly. <laughs> you know, without worrying about that. Um there's so much to talk about with you guys. Uh, you guys go back to the late 80s musically. You've built something uh, basically unprecedented uh, in terms of your fan base and, and your support and the way you've built your careers. Um, but first, I want to touch on how you started. So, uh, Jay, if you can paint a picture for us of, of what your lives were like when you first started getting into making music. Let's start there. We wanted to be wrestlers. You know, We grew up in, uh, just outside of Detroit in a suburb called Ferndale which is uh, right along 8 Mile Road. We actually grew up probably three, three or four miles from where Eminem grew up. You know, same exact street, same exact area. Um, but um, we wanted to be wrestlers, you know, and that was our goal. So we had backyard rings built and everything, and we were little kids pursuing that goal. But the more we started to love rap and hip-hop, you know, the more we fell in love with Sir Mix-a-Lot. And I'm talking pre-Baby Got Back. I'm talking about <laughs> yeah. the Swass album with Posse Got Broadway and all that good stuff. We're talking stuff. the 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and all the other hip-hop that... Uh, my partner here and his older brother, John, were introducing to, to me and just were fa falling in love with hip hop. So there came a time where we were like, we want to rap, but we want to wrestle, but we want to rap. But the day we decided that we were going to go for it and rap, and that was our new goal, the day we made that decision, we've never looked back. Do you, remember, do you remember that day? Yeah, oh yeah. Like it was yesterday. Like the day we said... We're going for it. We're going to do this. And failure is not an option. You know, it's like, it's, it, it's a, to cut it simple and dry, there's two ways up the mountain, mm -hmm. okay? You can come along and get discovered. You know, a, a, a bigger name rapper can come along and bring you on tour and put you on their label and make yeah. you famous. A record company can discover you. There's a lot of ways to be the successful. A&R can find you, whatever. You a know. lot of ways. Or... The guaranteed way is to walk up that mountain and start from the bottom and do it yourself. That's right. Press up 500 CDs, sell those, take the money, press up 1,000 CDs, just like it sounds. And that's, that's how you guys did it, one step exactly at a time up the mountain. I want to I go to that day. What do you remember that day of uh, that decision? Like, What prompted that very clear decision of 
it's it's going to be music and there's no way we're going to fail. Do you remember that? Should yeah, I, just- I mean, yeah, we we were just were doing it on karaoke machines and sticking your face in between two boom boxes, you know, play and record on one. And then we just said, you know, we got serious about it and uh and uh, uh Jay's older brother knew this dude named Alex who uh who owned a record store. And um and then one day we were just like, yo, let's have a meeting with Alex and his and he lived in his mom's basement, you know. Cuz he was he was we were we were um, we were pushing our little basement uh, CD or cassettes at the we time. We were making okay. cassettes ourselves, just with dubbing a them. Photo cover Kinkos, remember Kinkos? Yeah, yeah. We had a Kinkos cover copy, and we were just running, you know, blank tapes, Maxell tapes, and we were selling them out of his this guy Alex out of his record store. So we had a meeting with Alex, and because he had sold something like nineteen copies, we were like, know, oh, like, that's it. And so we, we had a meeting with Alex, and we were like, you know, you got some money. You could put us in a real studio. You know, you want to work out some deal and have you manage us, you know? We had a big meeting in the basement. Why did you decide to take it so serious that day? What was it? What changed? The love. No hmm. doubt. I mean, we were just ready to do it. We, we just were like, we, you know, we knew we weren't going to wrestle no more. You know what I'm saying? We, we were all pretty much dropped out of high school by that time <laughs> you know it was just time Keeping to, to real, get serious you know, about something you know the, the, and that, that was just our calling you know and we wow. were just like it's time to do this for real we get wanted to, real to be studio. wrestlers and we actually accomplished that like we started wrestling around the midwest and we were actually independent wrestlers you okay. know and um and it was just 20 guys in a locker room you know all um fighting for their time out in in the ring, you know, everybody gets like 10 minutes in the ring and you want to get all your stuff in and the other guys get get their stuff in and everything and their moves. Everybody wants to do their moves and all for 10 minutes and you're sharing the stage with 20 guys and the the money goes to 20 guys and it's just... It you're was like, just that hustle not, is not working. It was much funner being a fan of wrestling than once we got to the other side of it. Hmm. We didn't like it. You know, the, the 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 politics of it and just it just wasn't fun. But at the same time we're developing this huge, you know, NWA came out, Easy E, Ice Cube, you know, this is blowing our minds. This is like what we wanna do and we're rapping away on these karaoke machines and we're getting tighter and tighter. And um it's just like our passion just switched. And it and, became music full focus. Yeah, we said, you know yeah. what? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I want to do this for a living. And we knew there was thousands of rappers. Everybody wants to be a rapper. Just in Detroit, right. Just Just in in Detroit, Detroit, there was was a million rappers. But we were like, once once we had that meeting with Alex and he decided that he would invest in us the the $4,000 he had saved up for studio and Mm -hmm. to press up our first release. Once he decided that, you know, we just said, this is it. And it was on. This is it. This is it. There is no failure. It's not even... Uh, option like you could do this, this, this. The failure wasn't an yeah, option. And the thing was, we didn't, we didn't even know about that 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 hip hop shop freestyling world that was going on in Detroit at the time because that was so it was so small. What most people were doing was pressing up their own records, you know, pressing up their own cassettes and selling them, you know. And that's that that's the route we took because we didn't know the other route, and we ain't yeah. freestylers, you know. At least I ain't no freestyler, you know. Yeah, uh, that's exactly the, right. There yeah. was two scenes in Detroit. And we didn't know nothing. We never even heard of the other scene because we were just buying cassettes of people Buying that cassettes. were putting out independently in Detroit. Okay. So that's the only route that we knew. We didn't know there was another like uh, a hip-hop shop where people were sitting around freestyling. Hmm. We didn't even know that existed. You know. So you guys went about it the, the one way that you knew, which was making your music, recording it, selling it hand-to-hand. Straight up. Straight like up. being your own record label. And that's how you started your long climb uh, up the mountain, uh, and you reached incredible heights. Now, th- that climb obviously doesn't happen overnight. No, no uh, I sure don't. You've arrived at this place where you're at right now, um, where you have this totally unique community of fans around what you do. For people who don't understand or don't know about Juggalos, how would you explain how they relate to your music and how they relate to each other? Like, what is a Juggalo? They're, they're, first of all, they're definitely... The bond is way beyond uh, what you consider a fan. It's a family. It really is. There are, there are elements in our music, lyrics, certain things, certain lines that we might say that describe the type of person we truly are. There's a lot of entertainment in our music, of course. Mm-hmm. Murder, death, 
axe murder clowns, a lot of entertainment. But there's certain lines and certain things we say that are very real, you know. And uh, certain people pick up on those lines. Other people don't. You know, other people hate us. They hate us. They could listen to our entire catalog and hate our guts. But there are other people, it just seems like they were meant to hear it because they pick up on certain things we say and they relate to that. You know, hmm. and they're like, that's just like me and my crew. That's just like us. You know, there's certain things we say. And um, we started meeting people that were just like us. And it was so easy to entertain them because we just look at each other and say, you know, what would be cool is if we did this. So we started doing that. And we just started doing the things we thought would be cool. Mm -hmm. And those people that were picking up our vibe who, for whatever reason, were just like us, so they also thought it was cool, and it just started getting bigger and bigger and closer and closer. Like, um, it wasn't just about the music. We wanted to get together for any reason. You know, these people, like, yeah. and here's the best way I can explain it as quickly as I can. A lot of people feel like they're alone. They're the only one that thinks like they do or feels the way they do, but then when they heard this music, they realized, man, these guys making this music, they're, they're, they're just like me. They find the same things funny I do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not alone. I hear these guys. I relate to these guys. So when they go to our concert or something we're doing, they're now meeting all kinds of people right, like the them. the same people that think that of like that. That also thought that like, they were alone. That's right. right. Is that what you say, Shag? That, that explains why this connection is so strong it's it's as jay said more than just man. fandom yeah it's 100 percent because i mean bottom line is it's like so many people uh musicians and whatnot and bands you know they say you know it's because of our fans where we're, where we're at and we love our fans you know then they take off in their limo to their private hotel or whatever you know what i'm saying but like with us it's it's like we are the same people that buy our records and enjoy our music we, we come from the same background we are those same and we still are you know what i'm saying it's like it, it, it's crazy the connection we got with Juggalos because we are Juggalos ourselves, you know, and, and, and the, the, the stuff we go through and, and in our lives is, is very similar to, to the same things that Juggalos go through in their lives and whatnot, you know, that we've I, been through and we still go through. I could break it down probably 20 seconds. When we were kids, we were picked on in school. A lot of, a lot of people were, you know, mm -hmm. but we were picked on in school all the time, right up until we, right up until we dropped out. You know what I mean? And, um, here, as successful musicians, nothing's changed. We're still picked <laughs> on. We're still made fun of. There's, I picked up, we've sold millions and millions of albums. Millions. We've got, I think, five gold records and two double platinum albums, right? And, and I picked up an encyclopedia of rock in the States about four inches thick. It covered everybody who's everybody in alphabetical order. And are we in there? Hell no. We don't count. One hit wonders you never heard of are in there. <laughs> you know? People that have sold a tenth of the records we've sold are yeah. in there. But we're not in there because when it comes to ICP, it doesn't count. It's not real. Why doesn't it count? We're too cartoon to be taken serious in rap. And we're too rock and wild to be taken serious in rap. And then in rock, we're too hip hop to be taken serious in rock. You know what I mean? And the, we the don't have a live the, band. And the big thing is a lot of people are just like, most people are like, yeah, they sell millions of records, but they sell them to the Juggalos. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like Juggalos ain't real people or something. Like they're less than. Exactly. Yeah. We've you know? read reviews of our concerts where they talk about how horrible they are. And in the same review, they talk about how all the Juggalos were singing every lyric I love and it. having a blast, but it was the worst show the guy ever saw. And I'm thinking, how does that make sense? That's like having me review a country western concert. Mm -hmm. I don't like country. I'm going to tell you it sucks. Despite the fact 20,000 people in the arena love it and are having a blast. This must be such a fascinating experience for you guys to be at the center of that. At the center of all this love from your fans and all of this hate from people who don't understand it. But it's awesome. That's what makes us who we are. That's what makes it. The colder it is on the outside, the warmer it is on the inside. Like when we do get together at our concert 
and we're all together in some small packed club, that's ecstasy to us. That's we're together. All these people, they don't know each other, but they're like brothers and sisters. There's no fights at our shows. Yeah. There's no fights at our festival. It's so much love. People, like, that's 50% of the magic is them, the Juggalos. That's what makes us special. Well, tell me tell me what that's like. I'll start with you, Shaggy. What is that like? I mean, I've read about you guys hearing constantly from fans that your music has saved their life. That these gatherings are what they, these shows are what they look forward to all year. Yeah. I mean, what's it, it like getting that kind of feedback? It's crazy, man. It, you know what I'm saying? We're humble dudes. You know, we we, we live a normal life at the same time as it, it, doing what we do for a living. You know what I'm saying? So, like, for somebody to come up with you covered in tattoos or all your record covers and and telling you that, that your music saved their life, it, it's... It grounds you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, wow, I did that, you know what I'm saying? It, and it's, it's, you know, like I said, we're, we're the same dudes as when we started, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, to hear that, it's like, how do you respond to that? You know what I'm saying? It's like, some dude walks up, his whole body's covered in ICP tattoos. It's like, how do you thank somebody for that? You know, it, it gets hard sometimes, but like, it, it's still at the same time. It's like, you're so thankful that these people are out there feeling you so hard, you know, mm. that, that it, it's a crazy experience, you know, and sometimes it'll drive you a little bit crazy, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How so? We're, we're both on, like, medication for, like, mental stuff, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, it tears you in so many different ways, you know, and it's like you're sitting at it's home. so much. We're just it's sitting at home just pressure. watching a movie or something, just still realizing that's all on your shoulders, you know what I'm saying? It, it drives you a little bit mad. The you know? fact that these people depend on you that much, is that what the Not pressure? Not depend, or? but credit. Yeah. Credit us, you know, and in reality, you know, we believe in a higher power, you know, very much. And um, I believe that we, I don't know why, but I believe we've been extremely, unbelievably blessed and fortunate. You know what I mean? And I'm not speaking of any specific religion or anything like that. I just think that there's something out there that is that has blessed us. And uh, that magic is what these people are feeling, the juggalos are feeling. It it goes through the music. A lot of times we write a song, we don't even remember writing it. <laughs> like going back and recording it, it's like reading it for the first time. It's like, you know. Well, you know what's fascinating to me in terms of the magic that you've just been talking about? Like you, something you said earlier about how juggalos hear things in your music that other people don't hear. Or they'll pick right. up on lyrics that other people don't hear. Right. Why do you think s some people don't hear those those things? And because others they're focused in on the other stuff, the entertainment. You know, that's what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, which we put plenty of in there. You know, we we, we round our stuff out. You know, it's, it's, if you want to hear it in there, it's in there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but there's if you a lot just want of songs where there that's, is that's super in there. You know, there's and that's part of your mandate. You guys believe in entertaining, no right? doubt. Oh yeah, we're not we're not apologetic about anything we've ever said <laughs> we've said a lot you know there's a lot of records where there is i mean a lot of songs where there is no underlying message you know it's just pure entertainment fun you know mm -hmm. but ju uh juggalos laugh at the same type of humor that we do you know and and they feel the same way for example if we talk about killing a guy that beats his wife or a, a, a guy that's abusive towards his kids, you know what I mean? We'll, we'll phrase it in a way that you know the guy we're killing is that guy, an abusive guy or somebody like, or a pedophile or something like that. You know, we those are the people we're mostly murdering, you know, mm -hmm. if we're committing murder in a song. It's hard to explain it because it really <laughs> is a damn circus. But... <laughs> Yeah, they pick up on what we're saying and they feel the same way. It's very much who we are magnified mm -hmm. and made into entertainment. It's just like wrestling, like you said at the beginning. It's like The Rock. I don't know if anybody out there is a wrestling fan, but when he first came into the WWE, he was um, Rocky Maivia, and he was playing some character, and it wasn't really working until he started being himself and amplified it and turned it way up, he became The Rock. If you smell what The Rock is cooking, you know. Well, ICP is very much who we are, mm -hmm. magnified and turned all the way up. We really do feel real about the things we're saying. We really do hate the people we're talking about we hate. But it's a comic book. 
Yeah. It's it's a it's a cartoon. And, and your fans, uh, more than fans, they understand that intuitively because they're just like you guys. It's a release. Yeah. It's uh, a release. I mean, we'd be in prison forever if we did anything <laughs> on one of our records, <laughs> you know? It's a release. It's like therapy to them mm. because they hear us rapping about the same kind of stuff they've been going through their whole life, and they know they're not alone. They know... It's We're like, mad about the same stuff. For right. Reasons. It's like it's like everybody says, keep it real, keep it real. We keep it real entertaining. You mm -hmm. know, we 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 take it all the way out to where like you know what I'm saying nobody's taking it. We, we all we have to live in a real world. Why does the music have to always keep it real too? Mm -hmm. Our music takes you away. In case folks are just tuning in, my name is Shad. You're listening to Q, and my guests here in Studio Q are uh Shaggy Too Dope and Violent J of Insane Clown Posse. Um okay, on that note of um you know, a lot of your fans coming from backgrounds like yours, not growing up uh, with too much, having seen and experienced some hard things. Uh, what are they telling you right now about their life and their world? And I ask because there's a lot of conversations now about what's going on in America. A lot of conversations about people, a huge and growing number of people feeling on the outside. What, what are your fans telling you these days? Is it different or is it the same as it's always been? in terms of their life and, and the, the struggles they go through. I'll start with you, Shaggy. I mean, it stays pretty consistent. You know what I'm saying? It's people that have been through hardship their whole life. Not everybody. You know what I'm saying? A lot, there's, there's people that are doctors, lawyers, whatever, respectable positions that yeah. are still juggalos to this day, you know? But, you know, that have came from bad backgrounds but made some out of themselves. You know, it, it, a juggalo isn't a specific person 100%. You know, mm -hmm. you can't really put your finger exactly – what that is, you know what I'm saying? Because there's so many different backgrounds of people that that are juggalos and whatnot, you mm -hmm. know. But uh, but you know, it's uh, it's uh, um, what am I trying to uh, the word I'm trying to look for? It's um, it, it's pretty consistent, you know, because yeah. it, it's it's the same grind as it always has been. You know, it's like. I, it's, it seems like people that aren't from America see the politics a lot more than we do in America, you know what I'm saying? Because we don't get into politics. I don't know nothing about it, you know? Uh -huh. I did interview people asked me about Donald Trump. I was like, I don't care, you know what I'm saying? I don't vote anyhow, so what do I care, you know? My taxes are going to be the same. Everything's going to be the same, so it's like, yeah, who yeah. cares, you know what I'm saying? And that's pretty much for everybody. People just like to cry. But uh, the thing is, it's it's the same struggle for everybody, you know what I'm saying? Everybody that that's... The same way that we came up and whatnot, where we've been and whatever, it's still it's always been the same struggle and always that will be. Hasn't really changed. No. Nah. What about uh, what you've heard, Jay, from fans? Is, has their experiences uh, changed since uh, you started building this following? Yeah, yeah, it changes all the time with the album that's out, the, whatever album we just released. See, I'll tell you, Shad, it, it, it we we call it the Dark Carnival. That's what the name we've given the magic. Okay, I look you in the eye and give you my word as a man. Okay, this isn't a gimmick. This isn't uh, uh, anything like this. We write music. I've written so many songs that I have no idea in my life where they came from or how the hell. I even use words I don't even know. I don't even use in real life. In, in songs, it's almost like stepping out of my body in, in creating a song. And then when it's done, I go back and read it. It's like reading it for the first time. That magic, mm. okay, and the magic that the juggalos hear from those words and relate to and the magic, the camaraderie between each other of the juggalos, you know, they come early. They get in line and they chant and they sing and they hang out. Juggalos have their own mini gatherings where we're not even there. <laughs> they gather themselves and barbecue like 100 or 200 of them in a park, you know, just to be together. All of that magic we call the dark carnival. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, whatever the higher power is that's, that's blessed us, we call all of it the dark carnival. And so when people come up and say, you've saved my life. I was addicted to this and this and such and such song or such and such album helped me get through it. And I want to thank you to us. We can't accept that credit. Huh. You know, we didn't save your life, man. The dark carnival, the same thing that is blessing us. We're sitting here right now talking to you. That's because 
We're blessed. I'm, I'm going to ask you more about the the dark carnival uh, in a minute because I actually want you to outline that concept a little bit more for sure. our listeners. Um, but first, I want to ask you: Was you know you guys uh, have embraced kind of your place as outsiders and and you speak you connect with the outsiders? But was there ever a time where you wanted more mainstream ex- uh, mainstream acceptance? Where you wanted to be in that volume of of rock and roll history? I could tell you two cool stories. Mm-hmm. One time, um, we we were touring with Bone Thugs and Harmony who of course have Grammys, uh, American Music Awards, you know, everything. They, 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 at one point, they held what we call the Matrix. That's when you're on top of the world, you know. Bone was there. So one night, we went out after a concert with Bone, and they were being paid to show up at a club, right? And just to show up and drink, you know, so the club could say, we got Bone Thugs and Harmony in, in the, the house club. tonight, yeah, you know. Yeah. We went with them, and seeing that life, you know, it was cool to see. It was fun to see, but it's not for us. You know what I'm saying? Like, it would be cool to be paid to go to a, just to go to a club and, and have, you know, but it's just not, it's, it's not, just you guys. not us. Shaggy, what about you? Because you guys have done some work with, with major labels. You've been in that world before. Like, was there a time where you said... Man, I want to, you know, reach that place. I want to be... I mean, I would say, like, when we first started our career, of course, everybody wants to reach that place. But once we got into a position to reach that place, we burnt all of our bridges with the quickness. You know what I'm saying? With, like, MTV and everybody. You know, they vowed they'd never work with us again. And we're fine with that. We've always been fine with that, you know? Because just the way we came up doing our own, we knew we could do it like that our whole career, you know? And at the beginning of our career... We thought you needed the help of major record labels, you know. So even though we were on a few major record labels in our career, we still had Psychopathic, which we still put out independent. Psychopathic records, yeah. Yes, that, that we still put out independent stuff on and whatnot, you know what I'm saying, all our old catalog and everything, you know. So, like, we, we I would say, like, yeah, I mean, that's everybody's dream at the beginning. But once we saw what it was about, you know what I'm saying, that's when we were like, we don't need this, you know. Yeah, it's we like, started out independent, mm-hmm. putting out albums, until we got so successful that, a major came and signed us, and then that turned into a nightmare. You know, it wasn't. It, it was. It was. It was good for our career eventually, but dealing with other people in in our ideas, sharing ideas with strangers. Nobody I'm, knows how to how to how to put us out and market us besides us. You know what right. I'm saying? No A and R knows how to do it. No record label head knows how to do it. They've they've tried and they failed miserably without us in the mix doing it. And so you came other, back to. Doing it on your own. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and the other story I was going to tell you was one time we went to the Billboard Music Awards. Just, we've never done anything like we that. We got invited out the blue. We were like, what? But but we were like, why not? We're always on the Billboard charts. Let's go to the Billboard Music Awards. And we walked the red carpet. When we got out of that limousine, you know, all the fans that gather to watch, the people watch the red carpet. When we got out of that limousine, we got booed. Round of yeah. booze. So we were loving it. We were like, yeah. yeah. You guys you guys embrace that. Yeah. You embrace that title. So what are you gonna do? Go hide in your shell? You know what I'm saying? We're like, yeah, bring it, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I consider Hate us, on. I consider us like punk rap, like the sex pistols of rap or the misfits of rap, you know, like I like being the bad guy to the mainstream world. Again, you know I mean? again, back to the wrestling world, you know, you guys are playing that character yeah yeah and and sometimes when we do an interview we cut a promo you know what i mean like getting hyped forget about it you know yeah you know (laughs) what i mean like wrestlers you know it's just does anything i mean you guys embrace that you embrace being the outsider you embrace that that the booze you know but is there anything that hurts you guys that you hear in the press yeah you know, people say any press is good press, even the negative press. It's not true. Let let an article come out and call you a racist. You know what I mean? Right. Let somebody come out and call you something like that. And, you know, it, all press is not good press, you know? When they totally straight up make things up. Make things up. <laughs> yeah, like, like, okay, huh? for example, um, one guy came to the gathering and he wrote, there was a stabbing at the gathering, so I left. There was a stabbing on the first day, so I knew it was time for me to leave. That was his report, okay? First of all, the stabbing was between two hot dog vendors, okay? Like battling over business or battling, something. It had nothing to do with Juggalos. Juggalos don't stab each other, you know what I mean? Like that kind of press, hmm. you know what I mean? Saying the FBI, FBI saying Juggalos are a gang, all the press that comes with that, 
that takes our entire legacy, everything we've done, everything we've done in our career for the last 26 years, and it just takes a dump on all of it. Well, let's talk about that because that's uh, that's beyond criticism from the press. I mean, as you said, the FBI, 2011, they classified your entire fan base, uh, the Juggalos, as a loosely organized hybrid gang. And that's uh, affecting lives. And, you know, that's just not affecting our career. And I'm like, that's affecting well, yeah, tell people's me, personal tell me, lives. Yeah, tell me how that's affected uh, your fan base, that FBI classification. Come on, man. You got like a 13-year-old kid that lives out in the sticks, rocking a hatchet man shirt, you know what I'm saying, a rocking ICP shirt, and suddenly he's in a gang, you know what I'm saying, living in the cornfields in Idaho or whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's like... They're, they're in the Bloods or Crips or MS-13 or something like that. That's insane to even think like that, you know. You got people getting kicked out the Army. You got, you got you know, everyday upstanding citizens because they got a, a little hatchet man tattoo on their shoulder all of a sudden now in a gang file. And so the when, gang database, you know, and, and, and when you get sentenced, let's say you get caught with a little marijuana or something, whatever mm-hmm. the crime is, when you get sentenced, you get sentenced fine. But if you're in a gang file, that sentence is harsher. No you know what I'm saying? And we're talking about a guy who maybe is 32, works at a factory, raising his family, gets pulled over for a broken taillight. He's got a hatchet man on his arm tattooed from, from when he used to love ICP even. Now he's in the gang file. Now, if he gets in trouble, it's like being on probation. You know what I mean? Hmm. You get a harsher sentence. You get locked up. You're thrown in the, in the gang pods. You know what I'm saying? It's and crazy. Our, our business, Psychopathic Records, our independent business, there's guys that when we started out, they were our homies sticking by us. Well, guess what? 26 years later, it's their career. They have families, wives. Our, guy, our guys that work with us, they make a living off off psychopathic dark carnivals you know Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden chains like hot topics and stuff like that they don't carry icp swag anymore because it's gang it's gang memorabilia or whatever gang what do you call it apparel gang apparel so now all these stores don't carry our stuff because it's all gang apparel now and it takes something we did which was incredible which is juggalos are more active and more um you know, all around alive mm-hmm. than any hippies or deadheads or any Kiss Army or any kind of, you know, quote unquote fan base you want to call it. Juggalos are a family mm-hmm. and they're and they're more beautiful and open minded and awesome than anything in history of rock and roll. And then you just take it all. Hmm. And call it a gang. What What have you heard, specific, Shaggy? What, what stories have you heard from fans about how this has affected them? People losing their kids, man. People, people getting, like I said, getting kicked out the army. You know what hmm. I'm saying? People going to jail for unnecessary amount of times. You know, it, just like I said, people losing their kids in a custody in, in, in battle. Custody battle because they got a fucking my bad because they got a tattoo. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's crazy. You know what I'm saying? Just the whole the whole idea of it. Is, is pure insanity, you know, it, it's for them to, like, even think of, like, throwing that. I mean, because, of course, in any group of people, you're going to have a couple bad apples. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm sure there are juggalos that are in gangs, you know. Mm-hmm. There's people who listen to Willie Nelson that are in gangs. You know what I'm saying? There's people, I'm sure Jack the Ripper probably bumped Mozart back in the 1800s whenever he was around. You know what I'm saying? Does that make everybody listen to Mozart, a murderer, a serial We've killer? We've sold millions Ripper? of records. Of course, out of those millions of people, there's going to be some bad apples, you know. Well, well, Kenny Rogers has f- fans that probably... You know, could be child molesters or something. You know, does you that guys make have Kenny filed Rogers a, a gang leader? And you guys have filed a lawsuit against the FBI in response. Yeah, no question. We sunk a lot of money into it, man. Where's that at, Shaggy? Uh, they threw it out of court, so we appealed it, and I was back in the court. We know? won the second round. Yeah, so I mean, we have the ACLU. The Michigan ACLU took our has our back. I mean, actually stepped up. Hmm. And and have our back and are and are taking the case over for us and are fighting it for us, you know. And we, you know, I wish I wish I could tell you everything right now, but in just a month or so, we have our our festival and we have a a huge announcement to make, you okay. know. But I can't I can't reveal it. But good, I'm saying good. things are very active and things are very, um, you know, like when it first happened in 2011, we thought it was funny. 
We're like, oh, we're a gang? That's cool. We're gang then. But then once everything started happening, Repercussions started the fallout it continues affecting to Affecting people's day. lives, affecting your business, affecting a lot everything. of things. Most, most of all, I mean, affecting our business, yeah, in a major way. But I don't like to cry about that because we've been so fortunate. Mm -hmm. I'm more upset about affecting the people that want to represent us, want to wear one of our shirts or have one of our tattoos all of a sudden being called gang members. Well, let's talk about what they're representing. We talked a little bit about the dark, uh, the dark carnival. Right. Um, so you have this discography. It's built on this dark carnival mythology right. that came from your imagination. You guys have brought it to life with each album representing a different, uh, different character, different piece. Allegedly this, the, came yes. from our imagination. Allegedly. Yeah, Allegedly. I think it came from somewhere much more... Okay, well, tell me two things. Tell me where this concept came from, because this is fascinating. Your entire catalog is moving through this mythology. So tell me where this uh, idea came from, this concept came from, and quickly outline the concept as All well right. for us. The concept is when we started, we said we're going to release, right from day one when we came out, we said we're going to release six Joker cards. And a Joker card is an album. It's a black cover with a clown face on it. That's on the cover of the album. Remember when CDs used to come mm -hmm. out? <laughs> so each Joker card was more or less, it had writing inside that explained it. And if you listen to the album and you hear, you pick up on the messages, each Joker's card was more or less another way for you to look at yourself. Okay? Let me just give you an example. Yes. The third Joker's card is the riddle box. Okay. If you were to pass away, if something horrible were to happen and you or somebody were to pass away and you had to turn your crank today, right now, turn the crank, you know, what's going to pop out? Is it going to be an angel or is it going to be a demon? You know, where is your soul headed if, if God forbid, somebody were to pass away? Where is your soul headed if you had to turn your own crank right now? Ask yourself, if you turn the crank, you know. You know. You know, you know how you live your life. Box. And if, so each each album is a Joker's card like that. That, that asks you that, that question, sort of question in a different way. In a different way. The second Joker's card, the ringmaster, the the more evil deeds you've done in your life adds pounds and weight to the size of the ringmaster. The good deeds you've done in your life takes size away from the ringmaster. If you were to pass right now and you had to fight your own ringmaster, could you whip its ass or would it stomp you to death? See, to me, this is this is wildly imaginative. It's, it's very creative. Uh, tell me where this concept came the from. The holy creator, all right? I don't want to say God because I guess God means one certain religion. It could be Allah, Buddha. Ra, it, but, it, 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 I don't know. But you had a dream. Is that is that right? Is that right? It, it is and right. And I, I relate because I make music myself. I've had you know, just ideas, images, stories occur to me that are powerful, and they they're metaphorical. Yeah. So so tell me about this experience of where this idea came from for you. Well, when we were starting out, we were we were trying to be a street gang. There was a lot of gangs in in our neighborhood, and we wanted to be one. So ICP was inner city posse, but we weren't much of a gang because like I said, we were kind of scrubs, you know what I mean? We picked on, messed with a lot, but we tried. We put our paint up everywhere. We didn't care, you know? We ran around trying to get into fights and, and being stupid, you know? But I had a dream and it was like, I don't know if it's the right word, an epiphany or whatever mm -hmm. that word is. Epiphany, yeah. It just dawned on us of what, what we should be doing. And I'm telling you right now, like, my brother has always uh, role-played, like, Dungeons and & Dragons and, and all of that kind of stuff. I never was into any of that. But somehow, this idea came to me about the six Joker cards in a dream. And when I woke up, of course, it was all fuzzy, but I tried to clear it all up in my mind, and the idea ended up being crystal clear. Six Joker cards until the end of time. The last Joker card means the end of time will consume us all. So we wanted to speak in a language that the streets will listen to, mm -hmm. but we'll say something positive and we'll tell everybody 
that the truth will be revealed on the sixth Joker's card. So every two years or three years, we released another Joker's card. More and more people started wanting to know what's going to be the six, what's going to be the six. And the other thing was on all of our albums, we always throw the number 17 around. Mm -hmm. We mentioned 17 all the time. People would always say, what's up with 17? And we would say, on track number 17 of the six Joker's card, all will be revealed. And everybody and that, was that's just exactly like, how it went down. And that's exactly how it went down. I remember telling my mom this in 1993, trying to explain to her why our lyrics are so vulgar, yet at the end, it's going to be beautiful. And sure enough, years went by. We released the six Joker card. It was monumental in the juggalo world. And on track 17, that's where we said basically... More or less, we said the carnival is God, you know, mm -hmm. and we're not uh, sorry if we tricked you. <laughs> you know, we're not and, sorry. And we want to see all juggalos in Shangri-La. I mean, if you yeah. had your entire fan base waiting for you to say something. To right? me, this is amazing. Creatively, this is so sorry to cut you off, but creatively, this is so amazing because this these uh, albums, these six Joker cards have spanned how long? 1992 14 to 14 years. 14 years. And then people get to the end of the story. Yeah. And they get this big reveal They're at the end. They're waiting for what we're going to say. You got everybody's ear. The whole, your whole people that have supported you, they love you. They've given us our, our career come true. Thank you to these human beings, these wonderful people. And they all want to know what you have to say. What are you going to say? Of course you're going to say, man... This is all about God, and let's all keep the party going in heaven, man. Let's mm. let's let's keep it. Let's let's get it together before we die, so we can be together in Shangri La. Like, listen to the messages of the six. What was it? Really quickly, Shaggy. What was the response at that point? That's a huge moment uh, for all your fans. What was the <laughs> it response? It was pretty like? crazy, man. All of a sudden, people thought we were like a Christian group. You know what I'm saying? A lot of that came our way. Uh, a lot of people didn't like it, you know what I'm saying? But more people did like it than didn't like it. You know, it, it, it spoke to a lot of people, you know? Mm -hmm. Some people kind of wrote it off. It, 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 it is, is, you know, whatever, man. I feel ripped off. But it's right there in the lyrics. We're not sorry if we tricked you. You know what I'm saying? Because hmm. if you feel tricked by that, we ain't sorry about that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, how could you not dig that? You know what I'm saying? That's what we're wondering. It's like the, plus, the, the positive, the whole right. full message. Yeah. It, when, you're, when, you're, when you're 24 and you hear the six Joker card, you might not dig that. You might be like, how corny, how stale. But fast forward 20 years in your life when you're 44 and you've got three daughters, you might feel a little bit different about that last Joker card and what we said. You know, it's a message for life forever, you know, not just for you not at that, for that moment. hot summer. So, so then tell me this quickly, Jay. So how does the 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 violence on these albums and all those things play into this concept that is ultimately positive? Because it gets your attention. You can't just go on there and preach to everybody. You got to speak their language. You got to show them you're one of them. You got to, you got to, it's not that we're not, that all we care about, and like we said, we love to entertain. We, we are one of them. It's real. Hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, like we want to pull everybody in for a hug, you know, at the end of the day and say thank you for supporting us. And if you've got our logos tattooed all over your body, I just want to say, man, you know, live a righteous life because we believe in afterlife and we want to see you there. So all, all your fans have been following this this entire story, you know, even up to today. But to the mainstream, you're most well known for uh, the song Miracles. Uh, and you've talked about that song being about your childlike wonder, you know, at the natural world. But again, you know, many critics picked at the kind of sincerity of that song. Shaggy, what do you think critics are missing when they attack that song, I, I think I think critics are failed musicians that like to pick at stuff because they're player haters to the fullest because they never made it in the world of music. So they got to sit back in their office and just pick apart everything that is successful. You know, say because they're salty at the world because they never made it in music. That's what I think about it. Yeah, Jay, what do you think they're missing in that song? Easy, they're missing the beauty of the innocence. That's legit. 
We really are that stupid. I, really, I don't know how how um, m- a magnets work. You know what I'm saying? I was playing with my son. You know what I'm saying? My six-year-old son watching him freak out over some magnets. You know what I mean? And if you look at the world in a positive way, and you look at pet cats and dogs and all the things we consider miracles, I think it's a beautiful song. Mm. I think there's a lot of people like me that don't know how magnets work. And even if we do know how magnets work, they're still amazing. You know what I mean? All of it. All the lyrics are real. There's a lot of people like us that look at things for what they are, a miracle, you know? The mountains, the clouds, the sky, you know, everything is is a miracle. We're blessed. This is like a giant playground, and we're given freedom to do whatever we want with our life. You know, people walk around, my life sucks. Change it. Like, we're given this opportunity to live this life in this great place. You know, if you like it hot, go somewhere hot. That's, that's like one of my favorite uh, quotes I ever read, this this autobiography uh Tolstoy wrote, he was talking about how for so long he was like, life sucks, life sucks. Then he realized, no, my life sucks. I need to change it. Change no it. Question, yeah. um, I want to ask uh, before we wrap up about the bond between the two of you. Uh, I'll start with you, Shaggy. You know, years together making this music, climbing up this mountain. Uh, how has your relationship changed over the years or has it changed at Man, all? Man, it hasn't changed. You know what I'm saying? We might see like outside of work a little bit less, you know what I'm saying? Because we got families that we take care of and stuff now, you know, just like anybody that you're down with when you're a teenager, you know, you see less when you get older. But we're in the studio so much and we're psychopathic five, six days a week that we don't not see each other any less. You know what I'm saying? It's like eight, nine hours a day we're with each other, you know? Mm-hmm. And it just comes down to like brothers, you know what I'm saying? It's like not blood brothers, but brothers nonetheless. You know, blood I've known brothers. this guy since that's, I was. That's my little brother. Right, no doubt. You know what I'm saying? And I've known him since I was 10 years old. You know what I'm saying? I'm 42 right now. I'm about to be 42. You know what I'm saying? It's just like we think the same. We got the same brain. You know what I'm saying? We 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 like the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? When you got a band with like six different personalities clashing, of course, members are going to drop out and you're going to break up. We got two dudes that grew up together loving the same stuff, into the same stuff. That's not just you know my saying? brother. That's my boy. That's my homie. And once again, we're so blessed. No doubt, man. Because so many people hate each other. And we love each other for real. What's it what's it what's it like being on stage with and you look, you know, on the stage with you as this guy that you What do I do every night to your <laughs> ass on stage? I get slapped and molested and grabbed, man. <laughs> I goose his ass. We goose each other's ass. We have fun. We talk to each other in the back. If it's packed and it looks amazing, we're in the back of the stage. Look at this, man. This is awesome. This is crazy, you know? man. What's up? We, just like anybody would be, man. We're, we're not on that other side. We're real people, you know, real people. We are the people buying our music. We are them for real. We're not, you know, we're not those kind of p- people that are just on stars are up in the sky, man. Ice Cube said it best. Stars are in the sky, man. Real people are right here. You know what I mean? Yep. I think that's a fitting note to end on. Thank you guys so much. It was Thank great. you, man. Thank you. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you for caring, brother. Thank Gladly. you. Gladly. Gladly.